Hello everyone, this is Tesher Cohen, Happy New Year, and welcome back to another episode of the All Things Interesting Podcast. It's been a tremendous 2019, and as we make our way into 2020, I want to thank you all for helping make the All Things Interesting Podcast what it is today. For all of those new to the show, and for those who have been around since the start, The goal of the All Things Interesting podcast is to share with you the unique stories of individuals across a wide range of backgrounds, to deconstruct the passion and meaning behind what they do, and to provide you some of their perspectives on life. On today's episode, my guest is September Cowley, a current PhD student in linguistics with an interest in the areas of miscommunication, second language acquisition, and helping make knowledge about language and language science more widely available. So, without further ado, please welcome my first guest of 2020, September Cowley. Back at it with another episode of the All Things Interesting podcast. Happy New Year to everybody. And to start off 2020, I have with me September Cowley. How are you, September? I'm doing really well today. I'm excited to be able to talk about linguistics to people who are not linguists. Exactly. Linguistics is something that not many people are aware of. So just to kick things off, can you tell the audience a bit about what it is you do, and what linguistics is. Sure. Um, So maybe I'll start by explaining what linguistics is. It's actually a really difficult question to answer. The very simple answer that I usually give people is that it's the scientific study of language and the structure of language, Um, but it's kind of hard to really picture what that means. And it's also hard to get a a clear idea of what linguistics is, and you probably came across this in your research. Um, because there are so many different subfields. So there are certain areas that usually everybody kind of studies within linguistics, and that's um, things like everybody has to study uh, sentence structure, which is syntax. Everybody studies how meaning is communicated in language, which would be semantics and pragmatics. We all study um, sound systems and also aspects of physical sounds or the pronunciation of sounds, phonetics and phonology. But then... Uh, there are all these other fields. So there is neurolinguistics, which is just what it sounds like, the study of language in the brain. Um, dialectology studies, you know, different dialects of language. Uh, what else? I don't know. There's everything. Field work <laughs> is like you go and you work with an understudied language or with speakers of an understudied language and you try to maybe document something about the language. There's just anything that you can think of that could be studied in language probably is in linguistics. So it's a very broad field. So... Well, how did you get your start in linguistics, or what would you say was your motivating factor for going into the field of study? Yeah, there are many things that led up to that decision, so it's kind of hard for me to explain very briefly, but I'll try. Um, I've always loved language. I found that English was always one of my best subjects, and so when I started out in undergrad, I decided to initially I had decided to get a degree in English literature because to me that was the only way that I knew of that you could study anything having to do with language. Um, And at the same time I was taking a lot of biology courses which I also loved. I was lucky to have great professors in both of these areas. That was actually at um, Langara College in Vancouver and I loved the methodology and the objectivity of the sciences but language was also something that was so interesting and important to me. And so the idea of studying language still really appeals to me, even though, you know, doing like I it didn't seem like I could that was something I could do scientifically via literature. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And I had this goal when I was still back studying literature that I wanted to learn as much as I could about language and how it worked. um, And then to be able to write about it for other people or talk to other people about it. Um, my thinking was that language was such an important part of how we communicate, obviously not all of communication, but a very important part. And yet it seems like we miscommunicate all the time. So I wanted to understand why that was and to help people be better at it. Um, and so when I discovered that linguistics existed and that it was 
it, it sort of combined my love of the sciences with my love of language, right? It was this scientific objective way to look at language and I thought it would give me a really good basis to be able to um, study the things I was interested in and to talk to people about them. Uh, I should clarify linguistics is not the study of communication. I'm probably going to talk about communication a lot um, in this podcast, in this episode, um, but that's not what it is. You should not go into a linguistics <laughs> course expecting to talk about communication. It's much more like studying math or computer science um, or one of the other sciences than it is like studying literature or if you took a communication course. So if we can quickly touch on that just to get some clarity, how would you distinguish communication from linguistics if it's an area of interest for you? Yeah, so that's a little bit difficult <laughs> to say, um, partially because linguistics is not the study of mis of communication or miscommunication. Um, linguistics is, you tend to be using um, very rigorous scientific methods or um, maybe mathematical models to uh, model something about human language. It's a very sort of scientific way of looking at it. Um, I think some people probably find it a little bit too dry if there's if there are more um, sort of human aspects of language or communication that they're interested in. Um, and then the study of communication is going to encompass a lot of things that linguistics doesn't. So we don't talk about body language. We don't talk about uh, facial expressions. We don't talk about anything like that. We, linguistics is typically purely the study of language itself. That being said, it's difficult to even say that because there are areas of linguistics like sociolinguistics that study how language interacts with culture. And so I think that's an area of the field that can get more into the sort of communication aspect of things. But um, yeah, that's just not what you should expect in general <laughs> to be learning in linguistics. Right. So we'll, we'll dive into that a bit more. We do have a bunch of different topics we're going to jump into, but really to start off with the easy questions. What would you say is your favorite language and why? Okay, so I don't have a favorite language. Um, I'm not sure if linguists tend to. I, I know that some linguists do choose to focus on studying one particular language or a particular group of languages. And that might be because there's a certain phenomenon associated with that language or group of languages that they're interested in. But mm -hmm. I don't know that they would say that that's their favorite language. Um, and I don't really study languages that way. I don't have a particular language um, that I'm where there's some phenomenon in that language that I'm interested in. For me, it's language in general as this um, as this phenomenon that we all use, that mm -hmm. all humans use. That's really fascinating to me. Um, also as a social tool, um, but yeah, just the structure of language itself. So I can't say that there's one that I favor over any of the others. And there's also so many languages that exist in the world that I just don't know about. I don't, right. yeah, I don't know how I would begin to pick. <laughs> um, so here's a bit of a tough question right off okay. the bat. <laughs> sure. Is there a reason why some languages have multiple words to describe something while others do not? Okay, so I don't know that anyone can answer that question definitively. I think there are multiple reasons why you might see that kind of thing happening. I think the reason that people really like is that they want to say that, um, so they'll say things like, oh, Inuit languages have 26 different words for snow or whatever it is that gets said. Mm -hmm. I think people really like the idea that um, culture has this sort of deterministic effect on what the language will be like. And I think that can be part of why you might see multiple words for something in a language. For example, if um, textiles are very important to the culture where that language is used, it would make sense that there, there might be more words for textiles that are commonly known or commonly used. But it could also be a historical accident, right? Sometimes you get borrowings into the language from other languages and you just end up keeping all of those different words. But there's not really any cultural reason why that's happened. I mean, just to throw in my own thoughts on this, but is it possible that the reason that there could be multiple words to describe something is in a sense 
a level of sophistication used. So some individuals may try to sound more intelligent by using a more complicated word to describe something. Okay, so this seems like a slightly different question to me because this now is not so much a question necessarily of why different languages might have more or fewer words, but why an individual might choose to use more words or different words. Right? <laughs> That's fair to say, yes. Okay, so <laughs> um, just to speculate on that a little bit, I think it's definitely true that some people do, you know, try to make themselves sound smarter or uh, maybe sound like they come from a different language background than they really come from. Um, and so you will see people trying to use words that maybe they're not actually entirely comfortable with sometimes. Um, but everybody also has a little bit of a slightly different experience with language as well. Um, even when we're all, even, even within like one language, right? Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that I know that's been noted, and this is not usually something that's talked about in linguistics either, but it's something I'm interested in, is the effect of literacy on language. And so we know that, or it's, it's been noted in other fields, I should say, that if you read a lot more when you're growing up, then you, or if you're reading not just a lot more, but more broadly, more different types of reading materials, um, that you will have access to um, a broader range of vocabulary. And so the reason that, that that happens is because, okay, in spoken language, or just in language in general, most words are actually pretty infrequent. The really common words are what we call function words or closed class words. And those are words like in, of, the, an, before, like sort of the kind of boring sounding words maybe. And all the other words actually don't come up that often. Um, but it's been noted that in written language, infrequent words are more frequent. And of course, there are certain conventions that come with written language, um, certain ways of speaking or certain types of vocabulary that people just don't tend to use in spoken language because it sounds too formal. So if you read a lot, you might have more access to those words and you might really be more comfortable with those kinds of words. And then, of course, it depends on who you grew up around. So if your parents use more of those words, um, you're more likely to be more comfortable with them. You mentioned an interesting point when it comes to building a vocabulary of words in the mind. Is there a, a minimum amount of words required to kind of get by, if that makes sense? So to be able to just kind of do day-to-day -day communication in a language? Right. So that's not something that I've actually ever researched or been taught in a linguistics course. But I have read that um, it's actually a fairly small subset of words that tend to get used frequently in daily language. I read in one place, and I like don't quote me on this because it wasn't <laughs> a study, but I read in one place that you only need about 5,000 words to get by in English. Again, not sure how accurate that number is, but it's, it's probably true that there's sort of this, you know, set of words that's not that huge, where if you learn them, you could mostly get by, at least in daily day-to-day -day activities within that language. Huh, that's, that's a very few amount of words to really use to get by. Right, I mean, if you wanted to begin to express more complicated thoughts or to get into talking about like certain specialized disciplines or anything, obviously. Right, that's what, yeah, yeah that's what I was thinking, yeah. <laughs> you would need more words. <laughs> and another thing to consider here is that when you're talking about what words exist in a language, that gets kind of difficult too, because technically there are probably thousands of words in the English language that almost nobody knows. Hmm. Right? Can you elaborate on that? So they might be words that are only used in very specialized fields or that are sort of considered old-fashioned and so people don't really use them anymore and yet you can still look them up in a dictionary right mm -hmm. so then you kind of get into this philosophical question of what does it mean for something to be a word in a language like do most people have to know it or what if only <laughs> a little group of users knows it yeah it's actually a like it's actually a difficult question does that mean though that words tend to influx into reality and out of reality. So in other words, in olden times, you'll have various ways of saying things, but now they're not commonly used today. Does that mean words have a tendency to come in and out of society over time? Yeah, I think definitely words can kind of um, 
become more or less commonly used over time. Actually, if you want to see this kind of thing in action to some extent, there's a, a pretty cool site called Google Ngrams, N-G-R-A-M-S. And you can look at the word frequency, um, basically how often different words have been used over time for, I don't know, the last couple hundred years or something like this. Um, I think it's only in written language, but it's still pretty interesting <laughs> because you can see some things become very popular during certain periods of time and then they become less right. popular. Um, and lang uh, sorry, words also change their meaning over time. Um, words change their meaning over time. Yeah, so words, like a word doesn't have some sort of simple meaning attached to it that where it pers like permanently keeps that meaning and it's somehow inherently tied to, to that word or to that, that like sound or whatever. Um, and I think this is one of the things where you tend to see people getting really annoyed at it. Like people don't seem to like language changing, even though it's actually a natural process. Mm -hmm. um, so an example of a word meaning changing over time that seems to really bother people is um, the meaning of the word literally, the way that that's used. <laughs> so people, people like to complain about this stuff a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so literally, I guess, used to actually mean, <laughs> you know, literally. <laughs> I don't really know how else to explain it. But now people will say it to mean something like uh, some sort of emphasizer. So they'll say, you know, oh, I literally died. And of course, they didn't literally die but the meaning has started to shift um, among the younger generation. And this is the kind of thing that just constantly annoys people, <laughs> but it's totally natural. It's part of language. Wow. I, I never thought about it that way. I always assumed the word literally was meaning something is as it is in right. reality. And then I can see how, I guess, the most more recent generations are steering that word to emphasize something gradually. Right. This is something that we kind of accept in linguistics, but it's also something that when when you're talking to someone who's not a linguist, people will have really strong feelings on this. They they don't like it. People have very strong feelings about language and how it should be used. And um, some of those feelings are directed towards language change, mm -hmm. even though, again, it's totally natural. Right. I want to bring in a well-known figure, Noam Chomsky. Mm -hmm. Noam Chom. I can't pronounce his name that well, but Noam Chomsky. <laughs> Yes. Um, he argues that the human brain contains a limited set of constraints for organizing language. This implies in turn that all languages have a common structural basis, the set of rules known as universal grammar. From research or work you have done in your field, is this something you found to be true? <laughs> um, so... It's kind of funny to me that you're asking about asking me about this because it sort of puts me on the spot. This is a major debate within <laughs> linguistics. Um, yeah, so I definitely know linguists who would think that it was, I don't know, maybe kind of heretical to say universal grammar is not a thing. And we, we also tend to refer to it as UG, so that's probably what I'm going to call it here, not universal <laughs> grammar. Um, yeah, so I have, I have heard the arguments for UG, and that is the way that I was taught linguistics. Um, I went to McGill University in Canada for um, most of my bachelor's and for my master's. And it was a place where uh, we tended to be taught that universal grammar was real, that it was a fact. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, there are definitely linguists who argue against the existence of universal grammar. Um, and I don't know that I really want to get unless you think that it would be interesting, I don't know that I want to get a ton into the details of what the arguments for universal grammar are and what the arguments against it are. But basically there are people on both sides of this debate and I haven't, I don't feel personally a hundred percent convinced by either side. I feel like there are reasonable points on both sides. Um, and I don't really have a horse in that race. Uh, I try to approach things as objectively as possible. Um, and so I, I I like to actually try to fully consider both sides, mm -hmm. right? And I think that they both have reasonable arguments. So for listeners out there who don't know what universal grammar is or can visualize it, how would you describe the concept? And is there an example you can point to? 
So basically, it's this idea that um, language is an innate, innate capacity in humans um, and that there's some sort of you know, specialized language system in the brain and that this is going to constrain what's possible in different human languages. So what you would expect to see if you believe in universal grammar, and this might also be what you could expect to see if you didn't believe in it, but what you expect to see if you believe in your universal grammar is that while you should see variation across different languages in terms of how they do different things, what their structure looks like, um, that variation should be limited because it's constrained by basically um, this set of, of rules or something about the way that the human brain is constructed. So that's sort of what universal grammar is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Yeah, so some of the arguments that get made in favor of universal grammar are things like um, all languages are, th the claim is that all languages share certain properties. These are things we call language universals or linguistic universals. Um, and so the argument is that maybe the reason that we're seeing this across um, all these different languages is because, you know, it's something that arose out of this natural capacity that we have right. as humans. One question I, I have to ask because sure. it was uh, in my research and it seems as though many people might be interested in, in knowing this, but have you seen the movie Arrival and what are your thoughts on its depiction of linguistics? Right. Um, I love this question. So I have seen Arrival and uh, I actually saw it in a pre-screening of the movie. Um, and that's because, so when they were making that movie and they were deciding how to, um, how to depict the linguist, I can't remember what her name is in the movie. I think she's played by Amy Adams. Um, they used a linguistic consultant at McGill University, which was the university that I was in at the time. And um, that was a professor named Jessica Kuhn. She's a really great professor. She taught me syntax. <laughs> And so they actually consulted with her to ensure that the depiction of how the linguist was working with these aliens to um, to learn about their language, that that was actually realistic. So, you know, aliens aside, the way that uh, the linguist goes about trying to learn the alien language is actually quite accurate. Um, and I actually think that another professor from my university from McGill University. Uh, Morgan Sonderager also worked on that movie, but I think that he was working on something more like helping them to make some of the alien sounds. <laughs> um, I don't think that he was so much in the consultation part. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in general, that's a pretty accurate depiction of what a certain type of linguist would be doing. Um, and that would be a field worker, someone who works to, docu like to document languages or works with speakers of certain languages to either help them with their language goals or to learn something more about the language. Right. Um, and at the same time, okay, I'm going to do a spoiler alert because this is kind of an important thing to say. <laughs> but uh, so if you haven't seen the movie and you're still planning on seeing it, maybe like skip ahead a bit. But um, okay, in that movie, the big like plot twist at the end <laughs> is that, you know, she learns the alien language and they don't, they don't use time phrases or something or there's not so it's not temporally organized something like this mm -hmm. and so she's suddenly able to kind of travel through time um this is this is not something that <laughs> we would think was true in linguistics right so that part definitely not accurate but, but important to the plot of the movie so it right. had to stay in yeah <laughs> um to what degree does the environment shape language learning okay so um you mean first language learning like when children are learning language exactly first right? language okay so i feel like this is a broad question so what do you mean about um like what do you mean by environment in this case so let's just say you are a child living in a rural environment outside of the city and you have another person that is growing up in a the middle of the city in a cultural cultured environment i suppose it's kind of a bad example here off the top of my head but i guess what i'm trying to ask is how much of an impact 
does one surroundings and those around them impact how their language is shaped and how they're able to learn language. Right. So maybe something that I would think was really important to, well, there's a couple of things I would think were really important to say when we're talking about this kind of thing is that first of all, even though, okay, so it's true that those two individuals would probably grow up to speak language a bit differently. So let's just say they're speaking English. They're like person A in the countryside or wherever they're living, their language probably would sound different than person B who's in the city. But um, how can I say this? Even though their language use is different in linguistics, we would not claim that either one of those ways of using language was better or more correct. They're both equally expressive. Mm -hmm. um, they can communicate the same kinds of information, even if they're doing it differently. There's, there's nothing inherently superior about speaking one way over speaking the other way. Um, there are a lot of social things that tend to get t tied up with the ways that people speak. And uh, so I think people often feel like one way is more correct or is better, but that's due to social reasons. Um, so I just want to say that straight out of the gates, that even though I am about to say that it does affect the, the way that you acquire language or the exact way that you speak, I don't mean to suggest that one of those ways is better or that one person's way is impoverished or anything like that. That's not true. Mm -hmm. That being said, um, the way that you learn to speak is, I mean, you learn it from generally from the people around you, right? You learn it from your parents, your community, your friends. Um, and I am not a dialectologist, which is, you know, the person who would, it, so if, if I were a dialectologist, then I would have much more information on exactly how growing up in a urban environment versus a rural environment would um, influence your language use. I know, for example, that, uh, urban environments, cities, language, tend, so it sort of tends to be, um, I'm trying to think of the most neutral way to say this. Um, there tends to be more language change in those areas because, you know, you have a lot more travelers coming in and out of the city um, and that starts to influence the way that language sounds. Whereas if you're in a rural community, then language change is generally going to happen more slowly because there's just not as much outside influence. Mm -hmm. So there are certain things that you tend to see that are different in rural areas versus urban areas. Um, I think we're touching upon the sociolinguistic and communication aspect of linguistics. And correct me if I'm wrong on this. I recall us having a conversation prior to the show, and you mentioned the words descriptive and prescriptive linguistics. Mm -hmm. Does that in some way or another kind of touch upon this question? Yeah, so um, descriptivism and prescriptivism or somebody being a descriptivist versus a prescriptivist, these are the, this is something that we learn very early on in linguistics. Um, and just to be clear, there are, well, there probably are prescriptive linguists, but it's not like a particular these aren't particular theories within linguistics or something. What we mean when we say, okay, so in linguistics, we consider ourselves descriptivists. And what that means is that we don't judge language use. We don't um, claim that one way of speaking is better than another way or that one language is better than another language or one dialect or anything like that. We just observe what's going on in the language with the structure or the way people use it to interact or the sounds of the language and then we document that. Um, so we're just describing it, right? So this is part of the fact that linguistics is um, the scientific study of language, right? Mm -hmm. In the sciences, you're, you're typically not supposed to be judging whatever you're studying, although of course it's kind of, um, you know, it's, it's kind of natural to humans to want to judge things, but you're trying not to in the sciences right and so that what it, that's what it means when we say that um we're descriptivists within linguists ling mm -hmm. we're sorry within linguistics when we're talking about prescriptivism we are talking about people who um, believe in prescribing language use and that means people who do believe that there's a right way to talk 
um, and that some forms of language are better than others or that some languages are better than others. Um, and I honestly think that this is maybe most people. I think, I think, I mean, I was raised to be prescriptivist. My mom is very prescriptivist, even though we have lots of discussions about it. And I know that she's, she's sort of changing her mind about it a little bit over time. Um, so a descriptivist would just sort of see what was going on in the language and then go, okay, that's how the language expresses whatever, and I'll write this down, right? Mm -hmm. And somebody who's a prescriptivist um, would make statements about what kind of language you should use. So I'll just give an example because that's the easiest way to understand it. If your, um, if one of your parents tells you or, or your teacher or something tells you you shouldn't end sentences on prepositions, um, that's prescriptivism. Because even though this is something that we're sort of taught as part of like proper language use, we actually end sentences on prepositions all the time. So descriptively, it's fine to do that. That's a totally normal thing for people to do, right? You, uh, let me try to think of an example. You, you say, who are you talking to, right? To is, um, a preposition. You don't say, to whom are you talking? That sounds, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some people say that, right? And it might really be a part of the way that they speak. But for most of us, that sounds very, very formal. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the difference between those two things. I mean, most people I'm around, they say, who are you talking to? I don't yeah. say, yeah, I don't think anybody I know of ever says, to whom are you talking? That just no. <laughs> seems very olden, I guess. Yeah, so some people do uh, <laughs> talk that way, and there are aspects of my own my own language use that are that align better with prescriptivist standards, mm -hmm. and that I think make me sound a little bit overly formal. Like, um, if someone says uh, there's more chairs in this room than that one, I don't. For me, that doesn't that doesn't work. I would say there are fewer chairs in this room than that one, but I know that that sounds very formal to some people. Right. Um, and so this is part of the fact that we all just kind of acquire language slightly differently. We use it slightly differently, but my way is not better than somebody else's. It's just that's how I learned it. Is descriptive versus prescriptive, is it a contentious topic? Or is it something that's widely regarded as descriptive being the universal standard? So it depends what group of people you're in. If you are hanging out with a bunch of linguists, then the accepted thing is that prescriptivism... Um, I don't want to say is nonsense because it does have a social function, right? Um, there is a social reason that people judge each other's language use, whether mm -hmm. or not that's a great reason to be doing it. But linguists will pretty much across the board consider themselves descriptivist. Outside of linguistics, um, I think people, I think this is a much more contentious topic, right? People really do have strong feelings about language and how language should be used. And, you know, they believe things like that other people are ruining the language or that they're speaking ungrammatically or sloppily or things like this. Um, and yeah, people do get very invested in, in those ideas. It's something that they feel strongly about, probably because language is so tied up with identity and culture, um, right? So, you know, if you see somebody else using language in a way that doesn't seem right to you personally, that can maybe come off as some like an attack on something almost about your identity or your culture, right? Um, you know, you have your way of speaking, you learned it from your parents, you learned it from the people that you grew up caring about, um, and it's tied to your culture. And so somebody doing something different I don't know. I don't really understand, even though this was something that I used to feel sometimes before I took <laughs> linguistics, and it maybe I sometimes still feel, people, f it seems like people feel like it's almost an attack on something about them or their culture if someone else uses language differently. Mm -hmm. it, it, yeah. Before we had, we, before we started the show, we had a conversation, and you mentioned that individuals tend to compartmentalize their communication styles dependent on who they're with i think that greatly ties in with this because when you're around certain people and you talk a certain way it becomes habitual and commonplace for you to talk that certain way so i suppose when you see someone who talks differently 
I guess you become prescriptive, so to speak, and more judgmental to that way the other individual speaks. Yeah, it, I think it's it's sort of difficult to speculate on why it is that people feel that way. But one thing that I've learned from linguistics is that it's really not about the language itself. Um, because there's just nothing, <laughs> there's no... There's no objective reason, there's no factual reason to believe that one language is better than another one. Like, we're all people, we can all use our language to communicate um, whatever way it is that we learn to speak or that's natural to us. Mm -hmm. But there are, there is a huge social function to language, right? By speaking, okay, so for example, um, when I speak to someone in a job interview, that's going to be very different than how I speak to my sister. <laughs> Right. Or to my friends. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's really easy to think that w what you are reacting to is the language when really maybe it's something more like a belief that you have about what it means that someone is speaking that way or the type of person that you tend to associate with that type of speech. Mm hmm. But it's it's really not about language. So I noticed this in my daily life, at least, where if I'm around a certain group of people. Uh, then I will talk a certain way. And then mm -hmm. on the flip side, if I'm in a professional environment, uh, I completely change. And my word usage, tone of voice, how I talk is very professional, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of find that crazy when I actually think about it, how much we kind of alter the ways we speak uh, relative to the groups we're with. And I never really thought about what the reason for that was. I mean, do you have any unique thoughts on why that is the case i know you touched on it a bit earlier yeah i mean i don't i don't know that i have any unique thoughts in it but i can tell you what the sort of thoughts are within linguistics that i know about um so these different ways of speaking uh we would refer to as registers and this is part of sociolinguistics and basically registers these different ways of speaking have a social function right you're indicating something by the way that you're speaking so you might speak a different way to someone in a job interview or to your boss to indicate respect or to maintain distance between the two of you, right? Because, yeah, you don't want to maybe come across all buddy-buddy with your boss. <laughs> That's something I think some people do, but you might not want to do. And then you can also use language to indicate closeness or to indicate shared identity or shared knowledge. Um, so if you don't want to, and yeah, it can be used different ways. If you want to fit in and you don't want to seem like an outcast, you might, not necessarily consciously, probably mostly subconsciously, you might start to speak more like them. Um, and at the same time, if you want to distance yourself from a certain group of people, you might subconsciously try to sound less like them. And these are things that have actually been noted in sociolinguistic studies. So it's, it's a social function. Yeah, it has a social function. So I know we're kind of jumping ahead here into the social linguistics miscommunication aspect. So I kind of want to rewind real quick here. Uh, can sure. you kind of give a very high level overview of what that is? Because I know you have a, a huge focus in that area. Yeah, so I, I don't personally study socio linguistics. Um, I actually am mostly interested in uh, a subfield of linguistics called pragmatics. So Sociolinguistics is basically exactly what it sounds like. It's the study of um, how language is used socially. I don't know if that's what a sociolinguistic, if that's the way that a, a sociolinguist would want to describe it, but it's sort of the social aspects of language. Um, pragmatics, on the other hand, deals with all the non-literal uses of language. And this is something that is a little bit difficult to think about and to explain because um, we're so used to automatically interpreting everything that everybody says to us, but actually a lot of the time, a lot of the information we get from what somebody says um, is not based on what, on the literal meaning of their words. So here's a really simple example. Um, let's say that we're, let's say that you come over to my house and it's really hot out and you come inside and you say, I'm really thirsty. And then, okay, so... The literal meaning of those words, the semantics, is just, I'm thirsty. Oh, sorry, sorry. 
no, okay. Let me try this again. Okay, if you come over to my house and you say I'm really thirsty, and then I say there's a pitcher of water in the fridge, okay, the literal meaning of those words, the semantics, are just to communicate that there's a pitcher of water in the fridge. It doesn't mean anything beyond that. Um, but in this context, the pragmatic uh, meaning of those words, right, the sort of contextual meaning of those words is mm -hmm. probably that I'm offering you some of the water, <laughs> right? And so you'll actually see a lot of uh, comedy, like a, a lot of comedy comes out of these situations. So I could sort of make a joke by if you came over and you said, I'm really thirsty, and I said, there's water in the fridge and then you went to go get it I could say oh I didn't offer it to you <laughs> right and I'm sort of subverting the expectation mm -hmm. um, which is that I was actually offering you something exactly and, and I, so oh go ahead I was gonna say that sounds very contextual when speaking it's, yeah exactly it's very contextual it's hard to understand how exactly people arrive at these particular meanings and for me this is where it ties into miscommunication because there are so many ways that somebody c could interpret these different utterances in, in different contexts. For example, um, I was talking to one of my friends the other night about this example, um, my friend Cody, and he said, you know, people could actually even, uh, even something as simple as there's water in the fridge, people could take very differently. For example, if you come over and you say you're thirsty and I say there's water in the fridge, you might think, oh, that's really nice. This person is telling me to make myself welcome in their home. I can I can feel free to go into their fridge and get myself a glass of water, right? They're sort of inviting me exactly. into their home in that way. But if you come from um, having different expectations or you have a different personality, you might become offended, right? You could think, wow, like if they came over to my house, I would get up and I would get them a glass of water and, and serve them because I think that's what it means to be a good host. Mm -hmm. And this person is basically saying, get it yourself. <laughs> That's so rude, right? right? So you can see how easily um, you can begin to miscommunicate when so much of language is dependent on making assumptions about what the other person meant. Mm. So most people who study pragmatics, I don't think are necessarily concerned with this kind of thing, with, with miscommunication exactly. Um, but that's my real interest in it. And for me, that's also how it ties into sociolinguistics and miscommunication. So hopefully we're on the a same page here, but, but it really begs the question, what do you think is the biggest cause of miscommunication from the perspective of pragmatics and sociolinguistics? Okay, so that, <laughs> I'm, as I'm sure you know, is a very big question. Um, so for one thing, miscommunication or communication is about much more than just language, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that I would say outright is that I, st via studying linguistics or language, I can't possibly hope to understand everything about miscommunication. But in terms of just the way that language gets used itself, I think, and again, this isn't something that gets taught in linguistics, but I think the, the biggest reason that people miscommunicate when trying to use language is that we tend to assume that other people use language the same way we do. Mm -hmm. And that when someone says something that seems to imply something else, that we can be sure that's really what that person meant. Um, yeah, we, we just have this tendency to assume that everyone is like us, right? This is kind of a natural human tendency. Um, and this is something that even though I'm aware of it, and this is like the focus of my research, it's something that I struggle with. Um, so, yeah, I mean, language is not a perfect communication system. You can be totally wrong about what you think someone is trying to communicate when they speak, especially if it's something where there's a lot of emotions around it. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that's the biggest cause of miscommunication. So this might be very difficult to answer then, but are there some ways individuals can reduce miscommunication in that sense? I think the only way that you could try to um, mitigate some of those effects would be, first of all, understanding that this is how language works, that it's not perfect, that you are never communicating, you're probably never communicating exactly what you mean. And the way that people will interpret things and the way that you will interpret things is 
going to be different based on various aspects of your background. So I guess what the advice that I would give people is, um, you know, if someone says something, especially if you find it upsetting, don't jump to conclusions about it. <laughs> Keep talking through it with them. Um, make sure that's really what they meant. There's not going to be an easy answer to this because that's just not the way that language is built. Mm -hmm. It doesn't magically transport an idea from my brain to yours when I speak. So, you know, listen to people and actually be interested in, in knowing what it is that they really meant. You have to want to communicate with them. Now, this is somewhat of a funny example uh, one of my friends told me, and I haven't seen the show, but in one of the seasons of Star Trek, uh, the characters in the show approach an alien planet and mispronounce a few words with the people living on that planet. And for some reason or another, it started a 50-year-long war. Sure. I guess this supposedly this is a common theme in fiction, which <laughs> draws from real life. Have you noticed any real-world miscommunication on this level? Um, so I don't know of any miscommunications between cultures or groups of people based on something as small as the pronunciation of one or two <laughs> words. I mean, maybe, maybe what happened in the show was something like they said hello and it sounded like war or something like this, right? Right. Um, I don't think miscommunications are usually on that level, but I know that it is possible for, there are people doing research that show that cultures can really severely misunderstand each other. And mm -hmm. this is related to what we were just talking about, is that we tend to think that our way of communicating is the natural way and the right way, um, because we grow up speaking and using our language to communicate. But there's a lot of differences, not just between people in terms of how they communicate and how they use language, but also things that differ from culture to culture. Um, so for anybody who's interested in reading a short but really interesting article on this, there's an article by Deborah Tannen. T-A-N-N-E-N. -N -E -N. Um, it's a 1984 article, and it just kind of goes over all these different expectations that cultures can have about how communication should be done. And one thing that's mentioned, although I think there are, I don't know, eight different ways or so um, that gets talked about in that article. Um, one way, for example, is how much you should be talking. So uh, some cultures in general expect that there should be more talk like that you know you should just be having conversation mm -hmm. more of the time and there are other cultures where um, in general it's considered more polite or more correct in whatever sense to talk less and so if you get two cultures who differ on this front then you can end up getting cross-cultural stereotyping like whoa the members <laughs> of one language um, come to conclusions about everybody who speaks that other language because they're evaluating them based on the way their own language works. Mm -hmm. So some of the examples that I remember reading were things like the members of the uh, who sp of the community that speaks the language um, where more talk is expected will think that the people in the other culture are um, like shifty or they're hiding something or they're really cold and unfriendly because they don't talk much. And then on the other side, the group that expects less talk, less conversation, thinks that the other group is pushy or fake or insincere because they're, they'll say like, they're acting like your friend, but they're not. And where that comes from is basically um, what I said earlier, which is you're evaluating someone else based on the way that you would do things. But y these things differ a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So I think what we can take from this is particularly if you find yourself thinking that an entire group of people is all the same way, That's that's got to be incorrect, right? <laughs> it's probably that there's something that you're not understanding about the way that the language is used. Mm -hmm. um, another good example is that, okay, in English, we use a rising tone to indicate a question, right? I don't say, how are you? I say, how are you? And I think the feeling for English speakers is that that's totally intuitive and natural. Like, of course, what other way would you ask a question, right? But actually, worldwide, this is a worldwide. This is apparently not very common among languages. Oh, huh. how so? Um, so some languages, I don't know tons and tons about all the different ways that you can indicate a question, but some languages will use sort of s certain little particles that they'll put on the word or into the sentence that indicates that it's a question, and they won't use the rising tone. Um, and so you can also see issues when you're dealing with someone who is a 
not a native speaker in your language, right? Where they might not use the intonation that you're expecting. Mm -hmm. So if someone comes up to you and says, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> you might think that that sounds rude or right. weird or something. But particularly if you notice everyone who speaks that language or most of the people who speak that language doing that, it's probably that that's just not how that's done in their language. It's not that they're all rude. So just a cultural kind of formality. Yeah, language feels very intuitive to us, but it's something that um, different cultures have different customs or different assumptions about how communication and how a language, um, mm -hmm. how language works. So one thing I found when I was researching was that verbal language came before written language. Now, seeing as written language is secondary to verbal language, is there an idea of which one is better when it comes to expressing oneself? And this might be very subjective, so I mean, answer it, I guess, however, which way you feel. Yeah, so um, in linguist, so most linguists don't study written language, or t typically the focus is on spoken language. I have interest in written language, but I don't know, that's, that's not everybody. Um, but I think I, yeah, I wouldn't say that written language is secondary. Um, the way that I would characterize the relationship between those two things is that there's spoken language, which we all have. It's sort of something that anyone will acquire as long as they grow up around other people who are um, speaking or, you know, you might be using a signed language. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we should say non-written non versus written language. If you grow up around people who are speaking or signing, then you will naturally acquire that. Um, and then there's written language which is um, a fairly recent innovation, especially as something that most people uh, within our culture have had, had access to. So it's kind of this, um, this extra system that has been added on, right? It's not something that you will naturally necessarily acquire just because you're around it in the way that it, you would acquire a spoken or a sign language. Mm -hmm. So in terms of whether one is better at expressing oneself, I think you could argue in either direction. So in written language, you have um, chances to plan in a way that you can't with spoken language. Personally, I think I'm much better at expressing myself through written language or making arguments or points through written language because, you know, I have time to sit down and plan it out in a way that I can't with spoken language. And then on the other hand, um, when you're using written language, you don't have any access to things that you have in, in uh, uh, verbal or sign communication, like um, body language, facial expressions, these kinds of things, right? So I think it depends on what you mean when you're talking about expressing yourself. Right. And I mean, when I think about it more, I think they both have their place. I mean, in reality, if we did not have written language, I think in some ways we'd be subdued and limited uh, and our ability to do things. I mean, in front of me, I have a bunch of documents, and if I'm not able to read them, how else would I learn the contents which are in them? So I, th I think they both have their places because, like you said, verbal language, you have that ability to express yourself uh, and the tone of voice you use, uh, and offhand to that, your gestures as well that kind of convey how you feel towards something which written language does not do in itself. Typically. Right. Yeah, I would just say that they're both good for different purposes. <laughs> so one thing that I, I found really interesting here, and I've been meaning to ask, are there languages unknown to man? So when I ask that, I mean specifically, are birds chirping and dogs barking merely sounds, or are they a language we cannot comprehend? <laughs> right. Okay. So... I really like this kind of question, even though it's not normally the kind of thing that we would talk about <laughs> in linguistics. So if you take linguistics, what you will almost definitely be taught is that animals don't have language. Um, and the reasons that you're given are things like there is no sentence structure, like there's there's not this kind of, we, we would call it syntax. Um, they're not taking sort of separate units and then putting them together to make larger units in an infinite number of ways, the way that we can with words and sentences. Um, 
and uh, you also hear arguments like they don't have vocal cords developed for at least human speech. Um, although I'm not so clear on that argument because, I mean, crows and parrots can make speech sounds. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure what that one is supposed to prove, but that's what people will say things like that. Um, also, saying that is a bit problematic because obviously you can communicate just as well through sign languages as you can through spoken languages. So I don't see how not not having not being able to express something vocally doesn't really mean anything about w language. Um, and then on the other hand, so that's that's the linguistic side of things, right? We would say no. Animals don't have language. They they animal communication doesn't seem to show um, these sort of hallmarks of language that we see in human communication. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, my feeling on this is that uh, well, for one thing, we don't study animal communication. Um, so actually, to be perfectly honest, you know, it's not like we sit down and look at databases of whale calls or anything <laughs> like that. Um, and I also think that when people take a strong side, I feel like some people are going to think I'm completely loopy for some of the things I'm about to say, but that's fine. I'm going to say them. Um, there's something behind these kinds of questions or these kinds of assumptions, right? And which is that humans are humans typically want to assume that we're superior to other animals, um, and we're notorious in general for assuming that everybody's worse than us, including other cultures and races, not just animals. Um, we're not. I think historically, humans have not always been very good at evaluating other beings on their own terms. Um, so I think it's it's very difficult to know what's going on with animal communication. And I'm certainly not someone who studies animal communication. Um, yeah, I'm not qualified. I don't think that I'm qualified to say yes or no animals don't have language. Mm -hmm. um, also because even if we find that animals don't have these characteristics of human language, why would we expect that, um, that the way that they... Oh, it's so difficult to talk about because we do... We do believe that animals can communicate, obviously, but there's the argument is really over whether or not they have language. But right. the definition that we have for language is based around human language. So to me, it seems kind of unfair to evaluate uh, animals in this way because I just don't know why we, we would expect if animals are able to communicate complex ideas or thoughts that they would do it the way that we do. Right, they would have their own specific methodology for communicating, which our standards, so to speak, and linguistics aren't built towards. So I can kind of see that perspective. Yeah, and not just linguistics, but just the way that we tend to look at things as humans in general. So, I mean, when I talk about these things, I'm being very objective towards <laughs> what I think animals' abilities may or may not be, and I'm being um, very philosophical about it as well. Mm -hmm. Right? If you, th I mean, the short answer is if you ask a linguist, they're probably going to say no. <laughs> animals don't have language um but yeah i think it's something where we need to evaluate animals on their own terms and this kind of brings me to the next topic which i'm going to let you lead because it's in some ways a very complex topic to speak on so can you talk about the gestural theory and how it relates to some studies such as the chimpanzee uh, Nim Chimpsky uh, in the 70s as it relates to sign language and again keeping it on the topic of animals. Okay so I don't think I'd ever actually come across gestural theory before you had sort of mentioned this to me earlier. Um, so if this is right gestural theory um, says that human language developed from some sort of early gesture system right that was a, a primitive a more primitive form of communication mm -hmm. okay so there are lots of thoughts that i have on what we're talking about here um okay so you mentioned that there were these um sort of there was sort of an experiment done with this chimpanzee named nim chimpsky which is supposed to be a play on noam chomsky <laughs> i really like it <laughs> Uh, maybe I don't agree with what was done with this chimp, but I think it's a really great name. 
And so the, from what I recall, and I learned this in a language acquisition class years ago, but there were some people who basically tried to raise the chimpanzee around human children and expose the chimpanzee, Nim, to uh, all of the same input that the human children got. And they were doing it with sign language, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know correct, whether it was yeah. American sign language or another sign language, but they were doing this with sign language. And they found that although the children acquired sign language as you would expect that they would, the chimpanzee did not, right? Or it sort of learned some signs, but Nim, who I guess was male, if it's Nim Chimsky, he, he didn't learn sign language. Um, yeah, he, he couldn't really learn it. He learned basically just some signs, right? Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why he was unable to develop, I guess, a structured form of sign language? Yeah, so, I mean, I'm sure that there is a reason. I think there, there could be debate about what the reason is. Mm -hmm. I think that this, uh, people will sometimes refer to this, this case study or this example as proof that chimpanzees can't learn human languages. Um, and maybe if I'll, yeah, I'll provide some background. So sometimes people say that chimpanzees or gorillas know sign language. Um, from what I know about chimpanzees and gorillas, they can basically learn like some limited range of signs and then can maybe kind of put some of them together. But w we would, in linguistics, we would definitely say apes don't know sign language just because they can make some collection of signs, right? Sign languages are um, just as expressive and complex and complete as spoken languages. And so, um, you know, you wouldn't say that because you had taught a raven or a parrot to make human words, even if they were, even if they did say hungry when they wanted something to eat, <laughs> you wouldn't say that they knew English, right? Exactly. So um, something that I want to background this with is that uh, I don't think from from what I know, and I'm sure that if it, if it were something that had happened, it would be a big news story. Um, no chimpanzee or gorilla has actually ever learned sign language. So that's something that um, I just want to put forward before we talk about anything else. Mm -hmm. As in terms of uh, why it might be that they didn't learn sign language. Okay, so I already said that some people would take this as evidence that chimps can't learn human languages, um, that there's something about the chimp's brain or its cognitive system. They're just not able to, they're not as um, complex maybe, or they don't, they don't have access to those kinds of abilities. Um, but I think you want to be careful about saying these kinds of things. And again, I know this will sound loopy to some people. I'm not arguing that like chimpanzees definitely have communication systems that are as complex as humans or anything like that. Um, and I am not an ethologist. I don't study animal behavior, um, but I don't really know what the point of this kind of experiment is with raising a chimp around humans and giving it human input and then saying that it didn't do it and so it, it can't use complex communication or something like that. Um, I think if you're, one argument you could make is that that's what's going on, right? That chimps are not able to do this. They're not complex enough or something. And on the other hand, if you're going to study animals, you have to study them on their own terms, right? Um, you should be studying the way that the animal naturally communicates. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't make any sense to me to try to make them communicate in the way that humans do because th they're not humans, right? It actually reminds me of when I was an undergrad, I went to this really great talk um, by a primatologist and ethologist. So he studies animal behavior in primates. And I'm probably going to mispronounce his name, but it's Franz de Waal or maybe Franz de Waal. I don't know. And he actually ha wrote a book called Are We Smart Enough to Know How Smart Animals Are? And there was one study that he talked about in that book where they were trying to see if chimps could tell the difference between faces to see if they could recognize individual members of their groups. I mm -hmm. don't know what a group of chimpanzees is called, but that's what they were trying to do. And in order to do this, they showed the chimps different human faces. And the chimps did terribly at telling humans <laughs> apart. Um, and so initially researchers had concluded that chimps couldn't tell individuals apart. 
And then when the study was eventually replicated, but with chimp faces, you know, something that chimps would actually care about, telling the difference between chimps, they found that they were able to do this. Um, like they, they can tell individuals apart within, you know, chimpanzees, which makes sense. I mean, how many humans could be shown pictures of chimps and then tell them apart? That seems really difficult to me. Right. No, I think so, I agree on that. Yeah. So I think you want to be, uh, you want to be very careful when you're evaluating um, animals on their abilities, because we really have a tenant. We really seem to have a tendency to try to, to assume that in order to be able to prove that they have some capacity, that they must do it like a human. Mm -hmm. um, and we also tend to go into studying animals with the assumption that we're sort of superior to them. And I think this is a, not a great place to start from. Right. So I actually don't think that this, this experiment really said anything about what chimps were capable of except that they they can't do human communication that that seems right yeah and it goes full cir circle to our explanation of animals having a different sort of structure and how they communicate versus how humans communicate i mean just because i teach my dog how to shake doesn't mean they're saying hi to me every time they do the shake you know it's just no. they're, <laughs> they're doing it because they want a treat <laughs> <laughs> right you it's it's really kind of impossible to know why why they're doing the things they're doing. So you, I think you have to go into it as open-minded as possible, not expect it to look like what you're used to. Um, and that, that doesn't just go for animal communication, but really dealing with, and, and not just other um, people from different backgrounds, but just anybody, you know? You can't ever assume that people are doing things for the exact reason that you're doing them or that they're going to do it the same, same way. Mm -hmm. That's where a lot of misunderstandings come from. Well, there you go. That kind of circles back into miscommunication as well. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so... I want to just quickly jump into computational linguistics. I know it's a very broad topic, uh, and I would have a lot of questions going into it, but I just want to get your quick insight into what is a linguistics perspective on what computational linguistics is, and what is some of the work that can be done in that field? Sure. So um, this is an this is an area I find really interesting, but it's not an area that I've done a ton of work in. Um, so one thing that's important to clear up right away is that the term computational linguistics uh, gets used to talk about two different types of, of work. So there's, um, there's computational linguistics that refers to work that tends to be done in the industry. And by the industry, I mean um, companies like Google or Apple um, that are developing things like Siri or um, like the like Google Translate, this kind of thing, where the people working on this might not actually have any background or interest in linguistics, but they're working on tasks that have to do with something about language. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that they're actually studying anything about language. It's just there's some task they want to uh, be able to complete that task, and it happens to involve language. So that's one way of talking about computational linguistics. But the term computational linguistics also is used more within linguistics and academia, and that's something more like using um, computer programs to model human language or to actually help us learn something about the structure of human language. Um, again, I don't work too much in this area, um, so I don't know tons and tons about what's being done. But, oh, pardon me, that's the computer. Um, but I know that one of the things, uh, or sort of some examples are, um, there's a theory right now that's pretty popular, at least on the western part of the United States. I'm not sure, I'm not sure where it's spread to, but it's called, uh, so it's RSA models, or Rational Speech Acts models. Um, there's actually one of the professors in our department who would be able to speak on this much more comfortably than I can. His name is Leon Bergen. Um, he's very, he, he uses rational speech acts models. And there's also other researchers at uh, schools like Stanford and um, the University of California, Irvine, not too far from here, that are working on rational speech acts models. And it's basically based off of um, game theory. Mm -hmm. So this idea that when you are communicating with something, someone else, um, 
you have kind of agreed to be cooperative and you're trying to communicate um, information to this other person using as maybe as little effort as possible. Um, yeah, I don't, and so people will build computational models of very various linguistic um, phenomena using RSA mm -hmm. models. But again, it's not something that I'm super comfortable with. It is uh, kind of a hot topic right now in computational linguistics. So in that event, we're gonna go ahead and stray away from that topic and focus yeah. more towards a topic which I feel that everybody seems to find important and to want to do, which is learn a second language. And I think sure. it revolves around the fact that second language learning is very difficult. So I want to get your insight into the difficulty of learning a secondary language and what are some ways that individuals can better their chances or ability to pick up a new language. Right. So, um, yeah, so this is something that people talk about a lot, that it's much harder to learn a second language as an adult than it is as a child. Probably because when you're a child, you just don't even really notice you're doing it and you don't have, maybe also because you don't have anything else going on. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it seems to be something that you can do unconsciously as a child and that as an adult, you are usually doing pretty consciously, mm -hmm. right? You're like sitting down to take a class in that language um, or studying out of a textbook or something like this. Um, I think, uh, so sorry, what was the exact question so again? So can you talk a bit about the difficulty of learning a second language mm. as well as what are some ways that people can learn a language more efficiently at an older age? Yeah, so it does seem to be true that overall uh, adults have a harder time learning a second language than children or that it's something they have to do more effortfully or consciously than children um it's yeah it's it's difficult to say exactly why this happens um one thing so if i had to give if i had to tell people one thing just like a single thing to help them with second language learning um the first thing that I would address is this idea that adults can't learn a second language, which is something that a lot of people seem to believe that there's just no point in doing it anymore when you're adult, when you're an adult. Um, that is not true and research doesn't back that up. So even though there have been studies showing that adults maybe don't acquire um, all aspects of language to the same degree as children tend to, there are adults who um, are found to be able to do that and uh, they're still able to do it quite well, right? So it's not kind of this binary like, oh, it's too late now. <laughs> you didn't learn it as a kid, so <laughs> now you can't learn French or whatever. That's not true. And um, there was actually a study that I had run across at one point that showed that just telling people that language learning was still possible as an adult was something that, or that language, uh, language learning abilities were something that you could work on as opposed to something fixed that that improved their um, attitude towards language learning and their performance on language learning mm -hmm. tests. So the first thing I would say is it's possible. If you want to learn a second language, you can do that, right? It is going to take time. It's not something that you're going to do like on the weekends or something like that necessarily, but it is absolutely possible. As to why, why it tends to be harder for adults. So first of all, I think some people actually pick up second languages pretty easily, at least, yeah, I think some people find this easier than others. But maybe one of the reasons that people tend to find it difficult is because there's kind of this common scenario where, you know, you study a ton, you take classes for a year or so, you do all these exercises, and then you go to, you go on your vacation or whatever to the country where this language is spoken, and you try to have a conversation with a native speaker of that language and all of a sudden you freeze and you feel like you can't say anything you don't understand anything they're saying and it feels like you kind of didn't learn anything or you're confused like I know all these words I know all these grammatical structures how come I can't talk to this person um, and I think a big part of that is that usually conversation practice and especially conversation practice with 
speakers of that language is not something that's focused on much in language learning. Um, but there are a lot of things that you learn via conversation practice that you can't learn just by uh, doing flashcards or fill in the blank questions or stuff mm. like that. Um, so conversation practice has been shown to help with even those aspects of language learning, things like grammar and vocabulary. But there are a lot of parts of language that you can't learn just from a book that way. Right. So one thing that I noticed when I, I moved to Montreal to go to McGill University um, in undergrad, and I had moved from Vancouver. And so I don't know if everyone knows this, but Montreal is a bilingual French-English city. It's in Quebec, which is a French-speaking province in um, Canada. And so uh, there are a lot of people there who, they're, where, who are um, francophone. Their first language is French, and it's the, the language that they're the most comfortable in. And I had taken French courses. You have to take French classes growing up in Canada because we have two official languages, French and English. And so I felt like I should be able to, and I, I actually took a year of French when I moved there, and it even focused a lot of the time on um, Montreal French as, as opposed to like the, the kind of French that's spoken in France. And so I felt like I should be pretty well equipped to talk to people because I did pretty well in that class. Um, but when I went out to try to actually speak with people, I often couldn't understand anything that they were saying. And part of that is that the type of language that you tend to learn in a, in a second language learning setting, like in a, from an app or, or from a course, is only the most proper kind of language. It, it's not really the way that people are speaking that language kind of out on the streets or in their mm -hmm. daily lives. It tends to be very formal. Um, People are, tend to speak more carefully, like your professor might speak more carefully. Your professor might not even be a native speaker of that language. Um, but there are kind of all these little, uh, these little things that we do in language, um, in our day-to-day -day speak that, I don't know, some people might consider part of more casual language use, but that is actually also just a total natural part of language use that don't necessarily show up in those classes. Um, and so what I'm trying to get at here are what we call connected speech processes. And uh, an example from English would be, so it's this idea that words in isolation don't sound the same as when you put them together. Or words in careful speech don't necessarily sound the same way as they do when you're speaking more quickly. So in English, for example, often we don't say going to, we say gonna, <laughs> right? Or we don't say um, don't you, we might mm -hmm. say don't you. And for us, that sounds totally natural. Um, we know that don't you means don't you and so on. But you can see how to someone who's learning the language and has only ever learned don't you, that would be very confusing. Right. So I think part of it is that people aren't taught that kind of thing in their um, second language courses. And so they're suddenly confronted with this out on the streets and that's very difficult. Part of it is probably also um, the pragmatics pragmatics, so that's all the non-literal language use. That's something that's very dependent on culture. You can't just import all your assumptions about how pragmatics works from your first language, although that's what we're inclined to do. Um, and that's something that you're not going to learn in a second language course either. So I think that the best thing you could do to avoid that situation is just to practice conversation, like practice having conversations in that language about things you would actually have conversations mm -hmm. with. You know, sometimes in a language learning class, they'll have conversation practice, but it's like, pretend you are going to the restaurant, order a <laughs> glass of wine. <laughs> and you know, those are things that you'll do, but that doesn't prepare you for all the possible things that someone might say when you're out living mm -hmm. your life. Before um, we got started with the episode, I mean, I think we talked uh, a couple of days ago, but we were talking about second language learning applications i mean there's rosetta stone out there mm -hmm. there's duolingo uh, and then there's one that you brought up to me uh, which you had some work on yourself which was called chatterbug and you were kind of talking about how the application itself works differently than most other applications and it's able to kind of teach pragmatics more efficiently can you kind of go into that yeah. a bit so I don't know that I don't know that um, the 
the company would claim that they teach pragmatics exactly. And it's, I don't think that that's something that you can learn out of a book, but um, yeah, I'll just talk about it a bit and expand on that. So Chatterbug is a language learning company that I've been working with through um, UCSD, which is the, the school that I'm doing my PhD at. And uh, parts of the way that it works will be familiar. So if you just look up Chatterbug language learning, you'll find their website online. So they do do things like flashcards and fill in the blank questions, which I think we're all pretty used to with second language learning. Um, but they have novel methods of teaching as well. So I think the most notable thing is that they offer what they call live lessons. And these are video sessions with native speakers of the language that you're learning, where they help you to, um, they sort of guide you through lessons based on the things that you've been working on and the skills that you've been building on the website. Those lessons are uh, customized to whatever the exact things are that you've been practicing mm -hmm. recently. Um, and I know that they also have what they refer to as adaptive courses, which to my understanding means that w the material that you're seeing at any given point adjusts based on your performance in the tasks that you've already done. Um, and so the work that I do for them is that I do research for them. And I also write articles on various aspects of second language learning for their blog. So I actually wrote an article on the importance of conversation practice in second language learning. And uh, there's a couple articles I've written on them. My favorite was on the question of how age affects second language learning or, you know, basically whether you just can't learn a second language as an adult. The short answer <laughs> is no, that's not true. You can still learn one. <laughs> it's, it's fine. Um, in terms of how the application might teach pragmatics, like I said, pragmatics, I don't think is something that you can learn by reading about it or doing cue cards or anything like that. But I think where people get the opportunity to, to learn aspects of pragmatics using Chatterbug that you wouldn't with other systems is that you're interacting with a native speaker. Um, and that's probably the only way to mm -hmm. do it is that you need to talk to people in that language so that you can kind of learn how um, communication and, and pragmatics functions in that language. And you also get to hear natural uh, natural speech from people in that language, which is really important to be able to understand connected speech processes, right? Like in that context, you would probably feel more comfortable if, if let's say that I'm not a native English speaker and someone says, don't you? That's a context where I can feel more comfortable saying, sorry, what <laughs> did you mean? And then I find out that like, don't you, don't you, or don't you is how most people actually say, don't you mm -hmm. in quick speech. Um, so it's sort of a safe learning environment where you can do that. And something else that I think is really great about the application is that you're not working with just one tutor all the time. You get paired up with different tutors. And that's important because, you know, different people have different speech styles and they speak different ways. So, you know, if you only had one tutor, you could get paired up with someone who actually does speak very formally all the time. And that wouldn't help you to um, calibrate to people who don't speak that way. So I think that's the, the really novel part of, of the application. So it effectively allows you to take what you learned and apply it in a real world environment as opposed to being limited to what's written, I guess, or what you learn in a book. Yeah, it, it, can, it gives you the opportunity to learn a lot of things um, that you wouldn't be able to learn just from practicing grammar and, uh, and vocabulary because that is not... I mean, grammar and vocabulary are definitely things that you need to know to speak a language, but that's not all that goes into speaking a language. There's so many other things, um, yeah, that you really have to, you have to practice conversation. You have to speak to people mm -hmm. in that language. So as we're kind of running up on time here, I wanted to shift over to some of your work in academia, uh, and I'll just go ahead and throw out five quick questions and you can just answer them how you feel best. So just to start sure. off here, what are some of the biggest challenges you have noticed from working in academia? So I think this is something that depends a lot on the individual. Um, there are a lot of challenges that you can encounter. Um, one major challenge could be if you don't come from a family of academics right? In, in which case you just don't know how to navigate this system at all. That's a really big barrier. And in that case, it just helps to have people that you can talk to. 
who have already gone through it or um, who are willing to assist you on those things. I'm always happy if anybody <laughs> reaches out to me to ask me anything about this. I'm always happy to talk about it. Um, so there's that kind of thing. Um, I don't... I think even if you even if you don't come from that background or even if you haven't typically considered yourself to be like sort of a quote unquote academic type, I think that's fine. Um, so this was something I had mentioned to you before, but I actually never graduated high school. <laughs> I don't have a high school diploma. I did eventually get a GED. But I remember when I first got to university or rather it was college, I started at a community college. I was so worried that everyone had all these skills that they had built up through high school that I didn't have and that you know, I was gonna do really badly compared to them. And it turned out that that wasn't true. If you can still learn those skills. I was 20, I think 22 or 23 at the time when I went back to school. Um, you can still learn those things, but maybe there's more of a psychological barrier. That can be something, right? You feel like you don't belong there. You don't believe you can do it. Um, so that is one kind of challenge. Uh, but definitely I think that if people are interested in it or they are interested in trying out some university courses, go do it. It doesn't matter what your background is. Um, doesn't even matter, <laughs> matter if you didn't <laughs> graduate high school. Right, you can still do it. You have the capability. Right. Um, for me personally, I think a lot of my challenges have come from the fact that, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about communication in um, in the time that we've been talking today. And it's true that that's not the focus for most linguists. Um, and my main interests in linguistics uh, have to do with research that can be applied to people's lives, but that isn't necessarily normally the focus, right? A lot of people um, are interested in the knowledge itself. Um, you know, they're able to sort of immerse themselves in that and, and to figure out these different problems. But for me, it has meant a lot of extra thinking about, you know, what kind of research I want to do? How is this something that will be applicable to the public or that I can talk about that will be interesting to the public? Um, yeah, I think that's been my biggest mm -hmm. struggle. I mean, those are all definitely very valid and interesting points of view when it comes to struggles in academia. And I think you made a great point that despite where you are at, where you are, in life, you can always go back to school and pursue something you're interested in. Yeah. Second question I have is, for those interested in pursuing a career in linguistics, what advice would you share? First of all, if, if this episode of this podcast is your first introduction to linguistics, um, you need to know that you can't, and I've probably said this a couple times, and maybe I'm overstating it, but uh, it is not going to be all about like animal communication and miscommunication and that kind of thing. Just make sure you research it and, you know, maybe sign up for an intro class in linguistics or uh, read about it online first. Linguistics is a field that some people find very difficult. Um, it can be very formal. You will end up having to do <laughs> math at some points, um, which freaks some people out. Um, it involves learning a lot of different kinds of skills, a lot of analytical skills and formalisms. Um, you are basically never going to be giving opinions <laughs> on language, for example. You're, you're going to be looking at language very uh, objectively and scientifically and analytically. So that's the first thing to know. Make sure that that's really the thing you're interested in. And if it's not, that's fine. There's lots of other ways to study language. Just figure out which one it is that's going to work for you, whether that's cognitive science or psychology or literature or creative writing, right? Like, I think these are all perfectly valid things to be doing and important things to be doing, um, as is linguistics. So if you are sure that you do want to be in linguistics, um, I would advise people to think ahead with what their long-term plan is, right? So some people um, kind of go into linguistics and then they decide that they're going to get a PhD and that's great and they love it. And then they get out of it and they don't really know what they're going to do for work. Um, so just plan ahead. Think about how you want to apply these skills. Do you want to be in academia? Like, do you think you want to be a professor and you want to research on linguistics and uh, teach undergrads about linguistics? Is that what you want to do? In which case, um, I think it's a good idea to uh, you know, have respect for the other fields, even if they're not the subfields that you're interested in. Um, 
when you eventually have to uh, deal with trying to get a job, it's going to be a lot better if you're able to talk to multiple kinds of linguists, not just your little narrow area. Um, and if you're not sure, actually I would say regardless, the piece of advice I always give undergrads is make sure to build other skills. A really good skill to have if you're a linguist is computer programming. Um, it'll make it easier to process your own data and that means you don't have to hire someone else to do it or entrust someone to do it if you don't want to. But it's also very practical. If you're a linguist and you can program, you're, you're probably, you don't have to worry so much <laughs> about work. Um, and then finally, the thing that I would want to encourage people to do if they did decide that they were going to come into linguistics was to not be afraid to bring in ideas from other fields. Um, linguistics was built on ideas from other fields in part, and I think it can only strengthen a discipline to you know draw from other areas. I personally really like, I mean, maybe I'm biased because I came from like a literature background, but I really like when people come into the field um, from any kind of different area that we wouldn't normally consider the, the like quote unquote normal path to linguistics. Mm -hmm. I think it makes it a richer discipline. In your research or work you've done, what is the most fascinating thing you have personally learned about the study of linguistics? Okay, so... There are lots of fascinating <laughs> things that I've learned about languages and language, and I'm sure that if you pick 10 different linguists, they would all give you a different answer on this. Um, but for me personally, so this isn't, this isn't something that I learned about the study of linguistics, but rather something I learned from linguistics. Um, and that's just how, how incredibly difficult it is to use language to communicate. I think the more that I've learned about language as a system, and the more that I learn about different levels of language, the more areas I see there are where, you know, it's not a perfect communication system. It's not built for unambiguous communication. And in fact, I think miscommunication is inevitable when you use any human language. So for me, that's the most mm. interesting thing. So this next question kind of touches back on uh, the second question about pursuing a career in linguistics. But what are some career interesting career paths individuals can pursue with a career in linguistics? The most obvious ones are either working in academia, which means that you're a researcher or a professor, or working in industry, which means that you would uh, learn linguistics, you would probably learn some computer programming, and then you go and you work on like improving Siri or <laughs> improving the uh, like Google Translate or something like this. Um, those are the two paths that kind of get talked about all the time. But I think that if there is something else that you're passionate about or interested in, then, you know, there's other directions you can take it. So some people have taken linguistics and then gone on to work on making constructive, constructed languages for things like TV series um, or movies um, or even card games. Right now, uh, I have a friend who is really into magic, like <laughs> Magic the Gathering, the card game. <laughs> And there's this language, so I'm I'm about to, I don't know anything about the terminology of magic, but there is, I guess, a race within the magic uh, series or whatever, um, and they have a language called Phyrexian. I think the race is also the Phyrexians. And uh, my friend is, his name is Chip, um, is currently very engaged in trying to figure out basically, the, he's basically doing field work on Phyrexian. I mean, he's not obviously working <laughs> with speakers of the language, but he's trying to analyze the language and figure out what's right. going on in it. And from what I have seen from the work that he's doing on it, it seems like whoever they have working on building this language is someone that has a fair amount of linguistic knowledge. Um, it's not just some sort of random, it doesn't look like some sort of random made up language. It seems to be, you know, sort of a, an actual constructed language, which is really cool. So that's something that, I mean, if that's your dream, I would say go for it. That's pretty cool. Um, apparently you can also do things like training ac actors to have different accents. I don't know anyone who does this, but I hear that it's a thing. Um, and obviously you can work for second language learning companies, like, you know, like the work mm -hmm. that I'm doing. Um, these kinds of places will, uh, be interested in hiring linguists. Um, but yeah, there's lots of applications that don't usually get mentioned, I think. Um, I do some editing work on the side, largely for, uh, non-native English speakers, and I have found that knowing linguistics does make me a 
better able to understand why they're making certain errors and also better able to explain to them why those errors mm -hmm. are there. Granted, of course, if you wanted to become a professional editor, you would either have to freelance or go get some sort of certificate in editing. But these are all things that I think linguistics can help you with. Um, so definitely a large variety of very fascinating industries and career paths that people in linguistics can really go into uh, if they have a degree in that specific field. Yeah, I like to encourage people to, you know, take their linguistic knowledge and apply it in, in whatever way that they're really passionate about applying it. And it doesn't have to be academia or industry, although those are maybe some of the most mm -hmm. secure paths, right? But there's lots of right. things that you can do. So to close things off, if you could share one poignant or interesting thought with the listeners, what would it be? I guess what I would want to say is, um, so sometimes we can feel annoyed at the way that other people speak, right? It's pretty common to hear people say that they um, think someone is using the language incorrectly or they're ruining it or that the way they speak is ungrammatical or it's annoying. That kind of message is really common to hear. Um, for example, my mom, uh, who, as I think I mentioned, is pretty prescriptivist, although I think she's she's starting to sort of challenge some of these ideas a little bit. She tells me that she hates when people use the word literally, like I mentioned earlier. She she just can't stand it. It really annoys her. <laughs> she says, that's not what literally means. Um, and I think this is a sentiment most of us can relate to, right? Mm -hmm. Now... I could talk about how linguists don't believe that there's any ways of using language that are superior to others, which is true. That We don't think that. Um, we would say there's no evidence for that. And I can explain that the idea of ruining a language is not really a thing. Language is constantly changing, and that's, that's natural. So nobody's ruining the language. Um, but there's something else that I think I'd like to focus on, which is that we tend to have very strong feelings about language use. And it can be hard not to feel annoyed. This is something that I sort of touched on earlier, but I, I want to recap with it. Um, language is very tied up with ideas of identity and culture. And that might be part of why people feel sort of possessive about it, right? When someone seems to be using your language in a way that you think is incorrect, you maybe feel like they're damaging something that's really meaningful to you. But that's exactly why it's so important to question those feelings of irritation or judgment, because when you criticize the way someone speaks, you, you're not just criticizing their language use. It's impossible to do that because of how closely language is tied together with other aspects of culture. So for example, I'm Canadian. I lived in Canada until just two years ago. So I pronounce some things a bit differently than most Americans do. And I also use different words for some things than most Americans. So for example, I don't say soda, I say pop. Um, I say washroom, not bathroom, and I say pencil crayon, not <laughs> colored pencil. And yes, I do often say about. So it's not a boot, by the way. Um, it's about. That is the way that most a lot of Canadians would pronounce it. Um, but if you tell me that pencil crayon is the wrong word to use or that it doesn't make sense because they're not crayons or if you say it's not about it's or sorry it's not about it's about well that's the that's the way that we pronounced it growing up right that's the way that my friends and families use the language that's the way that everyone in my community pronounced um about growing up and we all said pencil crayon so when you criticize me for I mean, I'm not just talking about me, and actually I don't think I get too much criticism. People just th think it's funny. But <laughs> when you criticize someone for using those words or pronouncing things differently, you're not just being critical of their language. You're also, you know, probably intentionally, but you're also criticizing everyone that was important to them growing up and something that's ultimately part of their identity or at least closely tied to it. So maybe I'll end this with a challenge to your listeners, which is, when, if you feel, if you find yourself feeling annoyed at the way that someone else speaks, or you feel like you want to criticize it, maybe try to take a moment to think about what you're really annoyed by, um, because it's not really the language, right? Maybe it's something that you associate with that pronunciation or that type of language group, or something you've assumed about that person from what they speak, but it's not the language. Um, and I would also say, think about all the things that you're indirectly criticizing besides the language when you tell someone that the way that they talk isn't right. 
I think this is, for me, maybe the absolute most important lesson that you could learn from, from linguistics. Wow. That is a very, very humbling thought. And I really appreciate you kind of just taking the time today to talk about linguistics. I know it's a very, very, very broad topic and that there's a lot of subtopics involved, uh, but I genuinely appreciate you taking the time to kind of walk through, you know, some of these different aspects such as biolinguistics, sociolinguistics, uh, communication, uh, as well as second language learning, among others. Uh, but before we go, I do want to make one call out uh, for people who are interested in reaching out to you and asking questions as it pertains to linguistics. You do have an Instagram page, which is, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but ask underscore a underscore linguist if they want to reach out and ask questions to you. Yeah, that's right. Um, ask a linguist with the underscores. Um, it's a pretty recent project that I've started, but I decided that I really do want to, I, I feel like I'm ready to um, talk more to people about linguistics and language uh, use and stuff like that. So I am happy to answer anybody's questions on anything. I've had people contact me to ask, you know, random questions that they have about language, but also questions about academia. Um, and I'm happy to discuss any of those things. I'm always happy to help people with that. And I have decided to start doing uh, regular Reddit AMAs, which is like ask me anything sessions. So my name on Reddit is September underscore C, really easy to find. And I'm planning to do an AMA basically as often <laughs> as you're allowed. We'll see how that goes. That's about once every three months. So I just did one a month or so ago and I'll, I'll do one again in the future. And finally, if there's anything else that anybody wanted to talk about, you can reach out to me via my um, UCSD uh, email and it should be listed on our department webpage. So if you go to the University of California, San Diego Linguistics um, graduate student page and you just look up my name, September Cowley, it should have a listing for my email. So please contact me with, with any questions that you have. And also I wanted to say thank you to you for having me on the podcast. I love being able to talk about linguistics. Um, I think that it's a really cool subject and that there's a lot of a lot of uh, valuable things that we've learned from linguistics that should be things that are accessible mm -hmm. to the public. And it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. And I'll be going ahead and adding uh, the contact information down in the description of the podcast if everybody wants a direct link to those as well. Uh, but with that said, thank you so much, September. And hopefully uh, I can have you back on the show some point in the future to deep dive more into various aspects of linguistics <laughs> that we probably missed on uh, today. So thanks again. Thank you all for tuning in to the first episode of 2020 for the All Things Interesting podcast. I hope you all enjoyed listening to my conversation with September on the unique topic that is linguistics. For all of those interested in learning more about her work or have any questions, I will be providing a link in the description to her Instagram page, Ask a Linguist. It's been an absolute blast interviewing amazing guests on the show these past six months, and I'm looking forward to an amazing year filled with exciting guests that are currently in the works. Your support as fans has been immeasurable, and I greatly appreciate you all. So thanks again for listening. And if you enjoyed the episode, subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or your favorite podcast hosting platform and drop a comment. Stay tuned for more episodes of the All Things Interesting podcast.